Hi everyone, I'm Jae Hyun Jung from uh, University of Utah Asia campus as introduced by Dr. Middleton. I am, and thank you all for inviting me to the Salt Lake City. And I'm very happy to meet students and faculty members from the main campus. So today I'm going to share, my, uh, share part of my research titled Korean Food Television and the Korean Nation where I critically examined the intersection of food, media, and nation. In the talk, I briefly reviewed the Korean government's cultural policies regarding Korean food globalization, give you a quick overview of Korean food television, and discuss how the Korean government made use of domestic television and how state power is, how state power is circulated in television production. So before I address these inquiries, I'd like to talk about why I started this research. So I'm not sure about how many of you are familiar with bibimbap, uh, which is one of the most well-known Korean dishes. Anyone who's tried bibimbap before? To my understanding, there are several good uh, Korean restaurants in Salt Lake City, right? So how did you like it? I, I loved it. And actually, I was with Sajin when I first tried it uh, at the UAC campus. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Sajin, for introducing me to that. It was delicious. <laughs> great, great. And other, other, well. <laughs> uh, so go ahead, Sajin. Oh, I just said I had uh, very fond memories with um, Professor Middleton. So, yeah. Other thoughts on bibimbap, if you tried it before? Yeah, I, I myself was a faculty member, Jay, there at the UAC in 2014 mm -hmm. and 15 and have done some research since. And every time I go back, it's one of the things I, I seek out. Um, and I know the colors are, I don't want to steal your thunder. I know the colors are significant. There are a lot of things that are significant about it, but it is definitely one of my favorites. And it's like, oh. it's one of the first foods I might introduce people to if they didn't know very much about Korean food. Okay, great. So it sounds like UAC is a good venue uh, for trying uh, bibimbap for the first time. Right. So actually, bibimbap gained its central position in the discourse of Korean national cuisine in the mid-1990s, as Michael Jackson expressed his preference for bibimbap when he visited Korea for his concert, and as Korean airline received award from the International Flight Caring Association, uh, I'm sorry, Catering Association for bibimbap, uh, both of which became a huge, huge media event back in Korea. So here, I'd like to show you a short bibimbap commercial that was advertised at Times Square in New York City in 2010. So please think about what kind of meanings are delivered by this commercial regarding Korean cuisine and or Korean nation while you are watching. So let me play this short commercial. Taste of Harmony, Bibimbap. Okay, so because it's too short, I believe it's a little bit hard to catch the meanings embedded in this commercial. So let me play it again. Taste of Harmony, Bibimbap. Okay, let me stop here. So is there anyone who can tell what kind of meanings this commercial tried to convey? About Bibimbap or about Korean cuisine in general or about the Korean nation? So colorful, right? So diversity, colorful, and what else? I like to hear just a two or three more thoughts on it. Natural, right? And yeah, nationalist pride. It's not just about 
uh, bibimbap. It's more about Korean cuisine in general, and it's more about the Korean nation, right? So as you might recognize, this commercial uses a variety of visual and sound effects uh, that feature Korean traditions. So I can see another chat, harmony amongst the different ingredients, right? Harmony. So it uh, represents the taste of harmony as a taste of Korea, right? So Korean society is represented as a society of harmony, right? So thank you, Sejin, and thank you others for sharing your thoughts. So as I just mentioned, this commercial uses different visual and sound effects that feature Korean traditions, including uh, lion dance, taekwondo, and uh, the fan dance, and so on, right? And it portrays bibimbap as the taste of a harmony, as Sejin said, and which in turn becomes the taste of Korea. And this 30 second commercial was funded by the Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries and produced in 2010 by a team from the NBC variety show, Infinite Challenge, which is Muan Dozen in Korean language. And due to the high popularity of the te uh, television show, the commercial obtained widespread recognition in Korea and discourses of Korean cuisine uh, became closer to the surface of everyday life. Uh, there is another chat. Is the movement also maybe significant? Yeah, so choreography, right? So it sounds like a circular, right? So that visual effects and the movements are all carefully designed to emphasize harmony, a sense of harmony, right? And more interestingly, this media event demonstrated that the Korean media had embraced the subject matter of food to envision and to talk about the nation. So I was wondering about why the Korean media made use of food to speak about Korea. Why did they emphasize the embodiment of traditions in Hanshik, which means Korean cuisine? And why did the Korean government sponsor the production of media texts that feature Korean food? So my book addresses these inquiries by examining the conjuncture of food, media, and the nation in the Korean context. Then you may then be curious about why food matters among other cultural and collective practices for the investigation of the nation. As you may know, food means more than just what we eat, right? So uh, the ways we think about food are intensely reflexive. Indeed, people use food to speak with each other, to establish rules of behavior, and to reveal what they are. And as many researchers have demonstrated, food functions as a system of symbolic value creation, a system of communication, a structure of a society organization, a key component of a ritual, a marker of a social distinction, a site of a memory construction, and a domain of customs, beliefs, and meanings. And particularly, food and food ways are critical to the making and remaking of social identities and group boundaries. And food's role to draw cultural boundaries extends to the nation. Especially the flexibility and ubiquity of food keep nationhood near the surface of ordinary life and make people aware of where they belong and what they believe in. In other words, food functions as a banal flag of national identity in Billig's terminology. And this uh, flagging may be unconsciously displayed, but it continuously reminds people of the nationhood on a daily basis. I'm sorry. So in this regard, Bell and Valentine in their book titled Consuming Geographies, We Are Where We Eat, claim that food and the nation are so commingled in popular discourses that it is often difficult not to think one through the other which I strongly agree with. And to discuss the complex relationship between food and nation, food sociologist Michaela de Sossi proposes the concept of gastro-nationalism, especially to account for 10 national tensions in symbolic boundary politics. I'm not sure about if you've heard of this terminology, but according to her, gastro-nationalism signals the use of food production, distribution, and consumption to sustain the emotive power of national attachment 
as well as the use of nationalist sentiments to produce and market national food. My research is in line with the DeSoce's approach in that it investigates how food is used to protect not only material interests, but also cultural tradition and patrimony. Here, I'd like to introduce you to Korean government's interventions to national cuisine, focusing on its policy developments, legislation, and media relations that prevailed in the post-2008 era when the Korean Food Globalization Project became a national project. The Korean government's attention to Korean food culture became visible in 2004, even though I talked about post-2008 era. I'm going to give you more detailed discussion on the matter. So it became visible in 2004 when the Ministry of Culture and Tourism was dedicated to promoting national culture under the slogans of Creative Korea and Han style. And these projects aim to preserve and foster Korean traditional culture establish Korean cultural identity and raise a global profile of Korean culture. So please take a look at this table. I marked Hanshik, which means Korean cuisine in red color. So as you can see here, uh, Korean food was selected as a part of the essence of Korean unique national culture, along with the Korean language, clothes, I'm sorry, housing and paper. And Korean food was largely promoted for its industrialization and globalization. Although the Creative Korea and Han style projects were concerned with Korean food, it was not until 2008 that the Korean government became assertive about the global promotion of Korean cuisine. This focused attention to food. I mean, Korean food was mainly initiated by the government's awareness of the increasing size of the global food industry and of other countries' efforts to make their own food cultures global. And based on this economic awareness, Myungbang Lee, the 17th president of South Korea, announced the globalization of Korean food as a national project. And the Korean Food Globalization Project was designed as a part of the comprehensive plan for fostering food industry. As it was publicized as the first ladies project it soon became a national issue and received a wide publicity in Korea. And since its reorganization in 2008, the Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, hereafter MFAFF, it's hard to pronounce, played a significant role in Korean food globalization. And the Korean government also tried to establish the legal infrastructure for the expansion of domestic food and agricultural industries and for the globalization of Korean food. The enactment of the Food Industry Promotion Act in 2008 was an outcome of these efforts. And the act later became a legal basis for the establishment of the Korean Food Foundation, which became the only official organization of Korean food globalization. The detailed strategies of Korean food globalization implemented from 2008 to 2010 can be found in this table. As you can see here, examples include overseas extension of Korean restaurants, the establishment of Korean culinary institutions, making Korean food world's best five cuisines, standardizing and localizing Korean food, etc. And on March 17, 2010, the Korean Food Foundation was finally established as the only official organization of Korean food globalization the Korean Food Foundation pursued five different strategies, uh, such as standardizing Korean food, cultivating Korean food specialists, strengthening the competitiveness of Korean restaurants, constructing a Korean food database, and raising the global profile of Korean food. The Korean Food Foundation was devoted to the global promotion of Korean food and the overseas expansion of Korean food industry and restaurants since its launch. However, its policy orientation had a slightly changed according to historical circumstances and political regime change, especially in 2013 and 15. And in 2015, the Korean Food Foundation was replaced by the Council of Korean Food Policy, which uh, still continues. And although the Council's new plan emphasized the convergence of food, culture, and tourism, and cooperation among different government organizations, 
it still addressed the national cuisine as a driving force of the national economy and used it as a tool for improving national image and global competence of Korea. So before I talk about how these policies were articulated in Korean food television and production practices, I'd like to give you a quick overview of Korean food television as background information. Uh, I divided the history of Korean food television into four periods, such as the era of instructional cooking shows, that of genre hybridization, that of soft documentary and infotainment, and the explosion of food television after 2008. <clears throat> I'm sorry. As you may know, television production is a social practice, right? So we are different internal and external factors, including routines of production, institutional knowledge, professional ideology, and technological infrastructure are manifested and negotiated. And Korean food television is no exception. To my analysis, it has developed through interactions with a variety of factors, such as political change, government policy, broadcasting laws, broadcasting and communication technologies, and international relations, global and domestic economic conditions, and so on. In the book, I detailed the significant conditions that had shaped the characteristics of each historical period and what national discourses food television had produced based on those conditions. But due to the time limit, I cannot go through all these details but I'd like to roughly show you what kind of discourses Korean food television has produced in relation to Korean cuisine and the Korean nation. So of course, uh, discourses of the nation were differently articulated in each period because discourse itself is shaped by discursive practice and social practice. In general, however, Korean food television has portrayed Korea as an ethnically homogeneous and racially distinctive collectivity. And it has emphasized the food nature body identification. Uh, have you ever heard about Shintoburi discourse? Anyone? This discourse prevailed in Korea in 1990s, throughout the 1990s. Shintoburi literally means body and soil cannot be disparate or cannot be separate. Okay. So that discourse prevailed 1990s Korea, and that discourse uh, has continued until the present. So body, food, landscape identification, or food, nature, people identification. And as observed by many anthropologists and historians, national cuisine is a modern construct. However, Korean food television has depicted Hanshik, I mean Korean cuisine, as your cultural heritage that has a long, long history, particularly by concealing its hybrid nature. And another important discourse observed across the different historical periods is an emphasis on the superiority and uniqueness and diversity of Korean food and that on primordial qualities of the Korean nation, such as blood ties, collective memories, and shared past and ancestry, et cetera. Okay, let me get back to the issue of state power and television production again. So as I mentioned earlier, the Korean government became assertive about promoting Korean food both domestically and globally in the year of 2008. And in the same year, Korean television began to produce vast discussions on Korean food and the Korean nation. So the post 2000 era, uh, uh, Korean food television can provide abundant discursive samples for the analysis of the relationship between state power and television production. That's why I focused on after 2008. So let me first give you brief information about how government advertising is executed in Korea. In order for go Korean government organizations to promote their policies through domestic media, they must go through open tendering procedures via the public procurement service. Once each organization's public relations division posted a notice of bid on Korean online e-procurement system called Nara Jangto, PR and ad agencies participate in the tender either separately or jointly. Then the public procurement service reviews and filters out application submissions 
focusing on their plan for budget execution. Afterwards, the public relations division of each government organizations requests PR and ad agencies to provide a detailed schedule for public relations and media promotion and makes a final decision based upon their budget plan, efficiency, plausibility, and so on. And why promoting Korean food, uh, Korean food, the major actors that I mentioned, such as media, uh, Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, and the Korean Food Foundation actively utilize the broadcasting and newspapers so as to enhance the public's awareness of their policies and further achieve widespread consensus among citizens. And like other government organizations, they went through open tendering procedure via the public procurement service and made a contract with the PR and ad agencies based on turnkey system. Here, turnkey system refers to the ways, I'm sorry, in each government organization interest PR and ad agency with the task of public relations and media promotion as a whole. Excuse me. And based on this structure, the Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries and Korean Food Foundation publicized their policies in a wide range of ways encompassing outdoor advertising, transit advertising, newspaper advertisements, production sponsorship, virtual advertising, and products, uh, product placement, and so on. And when they promoted their policies through television, they either went through an open tendering procedure or sponsored particular programs based upon the request of television networks and production companies. In either case, they went through the negotiation process with the television producers uh, in the very beginning of a production stage. And however, similarly to other government organizations, they, caref they carefully hid their presence and tactfully concealed their purpose of policy promotion in concert with the television producers. And to enhance the efficiency of a policy promotion, the Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, for example, carefully negotiated with media practitioners with regards to the channel and degree of media exposure, reputation and viewer ratings of the programs, and the program's relevance to Korean food. Particularly, the MFA FF placed indirect advertising in such genres as documentary, entertainment, and drama. And one of my interviewees, who was the senior deputy director of food industry Food Industry Policy Division at MFAFF described this process like this. We and television producers plan the program together. For example, when the cast of entertainment shows eat or cook, we place particular agricultural and marine products in the scene. All our product placements, we try to incorporate them into the storytelling of television shows. I mean, in a very natural way. We carefully negotiate this process in the pre-production stage. And since its launch, the Korean Food Foundation has taken over the uh, Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries publicity task with regards to Korean food, quote unquote, globalization. On an annual budget of five to six million US dollars, it sponsored both domestic and foreign television shows, organized the production of Korean food related television shows, in concert with the foreign television networks and at times directly engaged in the production of special programs on Korean food. And concealing their relations to government policy, these television programs uh, that were sponsored by government organization or that were negotiated, uh, the production budget was uh, supported by uh, government, government organizations, legitimized the Korean food globalization project and circulated a discourse about the superiority of Korean food in terms of healthfulness, standardizability, and localizability. And not surprisingly, journalistic discourse on Korean food in Korea proliferated during the same period, which demonstrates the government's integrated policy promotion plan. And while sponsoring Korean food-focused programs, the key actors uh, I mean, the Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, and the Korean Food Foundation took a light-handed approach 
to television producers' production practices. In addition, television producers actively negotiated the government's request with their habitus, professional integrity, institutional routines, and assumptions about the audiences. So let me read some excerpts from my interviews with the food television producers. About government organizations' light-handed approach, one of my interviews stated, government organizations do not interfere with the television production as long as the government organization and the television producer share the overall objective. Because the government sponsors program production after reviewing producers' proposal and content value, it does not meddle in our production as far as we stick to our proposal. And the other interviewee uh, emphasized the significance of professional integrity by saying that when you get offered a sponsorship by a government organization or the local government, we think about its possible impacts on our program's integrity. If it does not interfere with our, our program content, then we accept its sponsorship. And audience expectation is another important factor uh, that affects television producers' negotiation practices. As my interviewee stated that the production cost of our program is pretty high because we do cooking competitions at overseas restaurants. Actually, we've got a lot of offers from government organizations. However, we turn down these offers because they do not meet our audience's expectations and because they can damage our program's integrity. And as these ex interview excerpts demonstrate, television producers were relatively free from government interventions as they prioritized their professional integrity, their program's essential characteristics, and their audience's expectations. Although the overall structure of the television industry is not separable from the state's political power, a television producer's individual production act is irreducible to political circumstances, according to my interviewees. However, the fact that government advertising had limited and mediated effects does not mean that state power didn't circulate in the production practices of Korean television. While the government did not compel the production of Korean food focused programs, it pushed television industry to quote unquote, voluntarily involve by increasing state funding for Korean food related contents and sponsoring particular programs. Likewise, through two round selective review processes, the government led television producers to deliver shared messages about Korean food and participate in its discursive practices. So we need to remember my interview is a statement that government organizations do not interfere with the television production, quote unquote, as long as they share the overall objective. <clears throat> and from the perspective of television producers, Details such as minor ingredients and filming locations are often considered interchangeable elements, which wouldn't betray audience expectations or producers' professional integrity. However, these elements function as an important channel through which government policy can be promoted and its connoted message can be naturalized. So let me give you one example. One of my interviewees who produced a food show titled Madam's Secret Recipe said, government sponsorship can make an impact on the program contents. However, we need to feature the cooking process in any case, because it is a matter of ingredients. It does not seriously affect our program. It is just a matter of whether we use shrimp or abalone for denjangjigae, which means soybean paste soup. The overall narrative of interviewees program is a visiting an embassy introducing the represented country's food culture and sharing Korean food with the ambassador's family. And in some episodes, the program featured the Royal Danish Embassy in Korea and the Embassy of the Republic of Ecuador in Korea and cast of a program cooked Korean food using pork and shrimp imported from Denmark and Ecuador respectively. So why my interviewee acknowledged that ambassadors attempted to promote their homeland products and used those products for their mutual benefits, she didn't recognize that her program could possibly justify the Korean government's 
market intervention in the pork industry in 2014. So as a production, <clears throat> I'm sorry, as previously noted, the government does not coercively exercise its influence on television production and television producers negotiate and at times challenge state power. Nevertheless, television producers taken for granted production routines make it possible for the government's policy agenda to be widely disseminated and represented in a government preferred manner. So in some television producers voluntary involvement led by increased state funding, the government's two round selective review processes in the pre-production stage and producers involvement without full consciousness contribute to the circulation of state power and dissemination of government preferred discourses of Korean food. And as explained in this talk, the Korean government based on its neoliberal understanding of globalization, used the national cuisine to raise its global profile to enhance Korea's soft power and to improve the national economy. In so doing, it continuously aroused the national consciousness by highlighting the superiority and rich history, rich history of Korean food by concealing its uh, short history and by concealing its hybrid nature. And to justify their policy project, government organizations also actively utilize the domestic television. Excuse me. And this analysis shows how food functions as a protectionist mechanism and a boundary work and how food is used to protect not only material interests, but also cultural tradition and patrimony, as I mentioned earlier, and which are core concepts of gastro-nationalism. So I'd like to wrap up my talk by revisiting Bell and Valentine's statement. Food and the nation are so commingled in popular discourses that it is often difficult not to think one through the other. Thank you. And thank you for listening to my long talk. And any questions about this talk will be more than uh, appreciated.